So you're starting to develop this this you know growing sense that the microbiome is 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 playing a much more crucial crucial role than than previously imagined and and you know this sort of leads you into the American Gut Project and the British Gut Project. So talk a little bit about like how that came together and and what that was all about and kind of what you discovered as a result of that. Well. So when back in 2011, there was no one really doing microbiome research in the UK, and most of it was going on in the US. So um, I got in touch with a, a colleague who I met at a meeting, Ruth Lay in Cornell, and uh, we we uh, did all the microbiome testing in, in her lab there. And she was linked with this group that had all worked with this really the the father of the microbiome, Jeff Gordon, mm. and who's um, based in St. Louis. And Rob Knight was another one of uh, his protégés. And uh, he learned that I was really interested in this. I, went, I was doing the, the big twin study and uh, told me about his project, which he just started, the American Gut Project, which was a citizen science project uh, getting Americans to sign up, basically donate money, in order to pay for their own microbiome testing. Mm -hmm. And I said I was really keen on doing this in the UK, and I think we could, you know, uh, the British public were up for this as well. And so we got together and um, under the banner of the American Gut Project and did this and led to a, a paper where the UK, I think, provided about a third of the, the subject. So relatively, it was more popular in the UK given mm -hmm. the population density. And uh, But together, we uh, did a, a great paper, um, which how outlined many were this. in the how many were in the study? There were about um, eleven thousand, I think it was in the end, mm. um, which doesn't sound much at the moment, but it was it was the, the biggest study done to date. Clearly showed a link between uh, nutritional eating habits, fiber, um, and health, and showed that these these clusters that you know uh, measures of gut health which is what, uh, then we used something called diversity um the more diverse the species the healthier you were and the less likely you were to be obese or have uh, diabetes mm -hmm. and so this was common to the, the british and the american populations american populations tend to still be they were slightly heavier slightly less diverse microbes compared to the british but th the key bit of that paper was it, 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 it was the one that found that 30 plants a week uh, was the sweet spot for maximum diversity. Mm -hmm. And that's, that study still hasn't sort of been bettered um, many years later. And, it, and it's, it's been a bit of a mantra for me in the books that I write for the public about trying to educate people about what to eat. Mm -hmm. And... I think what was really important about the study is that it showed as long as you ate 30 types of plant, and that's including nuts and seeds and um, to some extent herb mixes and spices, it didn't matter whether you had a little bit of meat, a little bit of fish, uh, you were vegan, vegetarian, whatever, your, your gut health uh, was still optimal. And I think that still resonates with me that uh, it's not about you know that one thing that you do or you don't do it's right. about the holistic view mm -hmm. of that what can you get on your plate and clearly if you've got a big you know if, if, if three quarters of it's filled with a giant steak there's not much room for your plants right so, so the, the top what, level rule just being diversity of plant life in your diet on a, the most consistent basis possible is producing the diversity in that gut microbiome ecology that is going to be, you know, the sort of front lines of keeping you healthy. Yeah, and it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a, a nice simple rule that means you don't have to be too strict about right. anything else because if that's your number one rule, then everything, you know, follow. Yes, it's nice to have you know, the rich, the colorful, polyphenol-rich foods. Mm -hmm. It's nice, to, you know, the fermented foods uh, we know are good as well, avoiding ultra-processed foods, uh, et cetera. But that, to me, is still number one. And I think that's been a, a, a good, uh, you know, 
a really good way of communicating it also to the public mm -hmm. about understanding so why that you want to feed your gut, why feed your gut microbes. You do it by eating right, and if mm -hmm. you do that, you know, you can't really have ultra processed food. It's very hard to get. You're crowding it out. Yeah, yeah, you're crowding it out. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's an easy rule to follow. It's flexible. It's doable. Um, it's easy to wrap your head around what that means, um, and it's withstood the test of time because that project was like 2014, right? Mm -hmm. When you were doing that. Um, so I'm curious about how that was received at the time. Like we're all talking about the microbiome now. Was that the case back then? How were your colleagues sort of, you know, receiving this pivot in your career and this focus on this new science at a time where this was just emerging? Uh, well, it didn't have any of the public impact that it, w it has now. Mm -hmm. So the newspaper- But they weren't like, you're a nutter, like you've gone off the reservation. Well, I mean, there was, there was awareness say, in 2014, people, people, it wasn't like, you know, pe people were talking about the microbiome. There was an interest then, not like was, now. But. Um, but a lot of people thought it was a passing fad. Uh -huh. That like a lot of these new science, think, you know, as soon as something comes up, a lot of grants follow it, money goes there. It's hyped up because you write a grant to hype it mm -hmm. up. That's how you get your money. Uh, and then it all comes crashing down again. And a lot of people thought that the microbiome was, you know, just a few years, flash in the pan, a few fancy mouse studies, you know, there's um, a few anecdotes of fecal transplants that were successful, and it would all fall over. And most of my colleagues in the UK were, were not keen on it at all. And so the countries varied about whether they supported it or not, and the UK certainly didn't. And um, that's because a few powerful people in science just said, this isn't going to work. Mm. It's rubbish. We've got to stick with genetics. It's the only way. And also the nutrition uh, the nutrition uh, sort of profession didn't embrace it at all either. They felt threatened by it and didn't approach it. So uh, pretty much on my own doing this, often with US collaborators or uh, overseas collaborators and getting maybe commercial money. And um, we used the citizen science funding actually to get a lot of our work done where uh, we asked the public to to actually pay for their uh, our research, mm. and that that really got it going. So that was that was really where we are uh, we were, um, uh, you know, up until uh, the time when uh, I realised I wanted to do the next stage, and I was giving a talk about the microbiome, and uh, that's when I met uh, these two guys came up to me and said, we'd like to form a company. And um, with all the trouble I'd been getting, getting money academically, mm -hmm. um, I said, aha, this could be my, my big chance. But, uh, you know, I'm warning you guys, you know, the science is very expensive and not, there's no quick results, you know, the way I want to do it. I don't want to do a marketing-led project. Um, with you know smiling MDs and a, and a stethoscope on on the front right. page, it's it, you know it's it's got to be serious science. It's going to cost you several million before we get going. So I thought I'd never see them again, but they came back a few weeks later with the money, and so uh, that's where the company Zoe was born. Right, and the the kind of operating principle behind that and the studies that you wanted to pursue were what specifically at that time? Well, we wanted to really test the idea that you could use the microbiome and other uh, blood tests to personalize uh, food choices and nutrition. That there was sufficient variability between people uh, that um, you could use that to predict everyone's response. Mm -hmm. And so give people a real idea of what they should be eating and um, came out of this idea that um, you know, there isn't one single diet that suits everybody. And all these studies like that of, of Christopher Gardner, the, you know, the diet fit study where, you know, they competed high fat versus um, high carb diets and both did well, no winners or losers, but mm -hmm. within, the, within the groups, massive differences. Mm -hmm. So, and at the same time, uh, an Israeli group had come out with, with a study showing that CGMs, 
uh, continuous glucose monitors um, were able to also predict responses to food. So suddenly the idea was they were to combine the microbiome with these, uh, these, these new devices on the market to suddenly have a quantitative way of really telling people how they respond to these foods. And, but the only way to do that wasn't in theory, was to actually do a really big experiment to prove it and see if it worked. So it was a big gamble at the time. Right. Um, but luckily, managed to convince uh, these guys it needed to be done. And the study was a thousand people, giving a thousand people, mainly twins, because I still believed there was yeah. a genetic component then. Um, who were um, studied uh, at my hospital, St. Thomas's, and, and a group were also studied at, in um, uh, Mass General, given identical foods at the same time, and then all their bloods studied, for, you know, and work up for 24 hours and then for two weeks onwards. And it was that experiment, which was the largest of its kind, that really was the basis for everything else we've done since then. And that was the PREDICT study. Right. And that, you know, that as well, that gave us the next revelations, if you like. So having known that the microbiome was different between people, um, mm. there were two other big aha moments there that when we first looked at the data. One was when you give people an identical muffin, there was at least a tenfold difference between normal people's response in sugar and insulin to that muffin at identical time of day in laboratory conditions. So that was, well, pretty amazing. Uh, there was also a tenfold difference in their triglycerides, their blood fat levels, six hours after that meal. So everyone clears fat at a very different rate. And up to that point, no one had ever thought to him look because mm -hmm. we only take fasting levels mm -hmm. which aren't mm -hmm. very informative and that really meant that we had the basis of a big enough variation to build algorithms to predict how people would do based on those sort of baseline standard tests. Right. So, so it, it provides this like sort of starting base to try to begin to understand the nature of personalized nutrition and lifestyle habits and the variations, you know, between people and how those, you know, certain variables that distinguish individuals, um, uh, can be, uh, you know, valuable information in terms of how people respond to certain foods or don't. And when you start to scale that up with massive data sets, you can extrapolate from that valuable information to provide, um, y you know, solid guidelines in terms of do's and don'ts, right? So that gets into the sort of citizen science aspect of, of the conversation that I want to get into, but there were so many things in, in, in what you just said that I want to tease out gradually. The first being just the realization that gut health, gut health, the microbiome in so many ways holds this key to unlock, you know, so many things that have befuddled scientists for so long. And there are a few things as complicated as nutrition. And, and certainly it's, you know, something that is so hotly debated and, you know, it appears that it, it, it's so difficult to arrive at any kind of consensus around. And you talk about this in, in, in your books, uh, but what's really kind of empowering and fascinating about the microbiome is its mutability. Like when you look at genetics, you come with a, you know, this is your DNA, this is your, this is your genetic makeup. And you can say, well, you know, my, my dad got this or my grandfather got this. I have a genetic predisposition to this. And perhaps there's some mutability around the epigenetic piece, but there's not that much that we can do about it. But with the microbiome, there is this mutability, right? And trying to understand how to kind of maneuver around that you know, mutability and kind of push it in certain directions becomes the vanguard of this whole new kind of horizon of science and discovery. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was a revelation because, you know, I was a geneticist. I've been finding genes, I'd been telling everyone that it's all a genetic basis. <laughs> Just blame your parents for everything, yeah. right? And hope You're that, eating crow now. And and hope that, as you said, you know, take this magic potion to tweak your epigenetics and you might you've mm -hmm. got a chance of doing it. But it was a pretty depressing talk and I was sort of, you know, getting getting myself down a bit about it. And so it was so 
um, empowering, really, to realize that, yeah, we're, we're, you know, identical twins have very different microbes and they respond differently to the same foods. You know, we had these identical twins. One would have a good fat response, the other a bad fat response. And the only thing we could find different was their microbes. So the fact that, you know, other studies before us, um, you know, this study, um, some out of UCSF had shown just by changing from vegan to meat-eating diets in four or five days, you can switch your gut microbes. You can do this stuff in a few days. Mm -hmm. So unimaginable to change your genes in that way. So mm -hmm. I think suddenly, you know, me personally, I was really energized to say this is really important and that small changes to your nutrition can have massive effects you know via your gut microbiome if we get it right and so everyone needs to know much more about gut health and the microbiome and treat it you know just as you would look after it like you would your heart right and getting it right is hard that's a that's a big hard problem right it's well, we a, were starting it, from yeah it's a, a different it, yeah it's like this I, I feel like you're kind of cresting this hill where for many years it's been about trying to understand the nature and the complexity and just the general landscape in which the microbiome operates and now we're in this kind of transitory period where it's about applying that understanding into kind of tangible you know protocols or or means of of diagnosis and and recommended therapies yeah no it, it's it's um, uh, it's tough and I think we, we mustn't you know again realize that we, we know more than we do and so mm -hmm. uh, we are just at the tip of this discovery you know the microbiome sequencing is is just getting to the point now where we're discovering all kinds of new um, elements to our gut microbiome like you know We've discovered this parasite. There's in one in f one, in, you know, one in four British people have this parasite called Blastocystis, and it's only in one in twenty Americans. Mm -hmm. And we've, and if you have it, if you went to see your GP, uh, he'd probably say, look it up and say, okay, we've got to get rid of this guy. You know, it's been shown to cause diarrhea and bloody, you know, problems and whatever. Uh, you know, better kill it. Let's get it out. But it turns out that if you've got it. You are uh, healthier, you've, you're skinnier, you've got less visceral fat, your blood lipid levels are lower, your blood pressure is lower, and it, it's a sign of super good health. And, it's, um, you know, and so we're discovering that this, this parasite actually probably eats other microbes that mm. are... Uh, increasing your fat levels so it's sort of wow it's a sort of predator of other microbes that we still don't understand which ones uh -huh. and having this effect so and it turns out all our ancestors had this blastocystis parasite and if you look at all the data whether it's modern day you know hunter gatherers or most third world countries 100 percent of the population's have blastocystis and modern living has wiped it out mm. and you know we even see big differences between you know midwest america and california there's you know where healthier people are it's a sign of healthy diets and healthy living it's uh, it's fascinating this is just one element of all these other you know we know nothing about the fungi the parasites the viruses the phages that are doing all this stuff as well so uh let's you know we can't get ahead of ourselves we could st stick to the basics as we as we learn and understand that you know we're all got different makeups and um different bugs inside us that could be doing different things right the insane complexity of all of it seems like a a, a perfect um dynamic for uh, introducing the tools of the emerging tools of artificial of artificial intelligence because they're so good at crunching massive data sets and and dealing with you know complexity at, at this kind of scale has there been any inroads with these these kind of emergent tools and how they might apply to this field well we've we think we've just about got to the level so we've now got We've been looking at our latest paper at 50,000 uh, stool samples from the US and the UK, people who've taken the ZOE uh, tests. Mm -hmm. And 
with those numbers that's 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 where you start to get this real power and so we're just starting that journey now to try and understand mm. it and link that with the health outcomes mm -hmm. but in a way we are we're doing this on a small level with our with our studies at the moment that's allowed us to work out what we think a, a healthy microbiome looks like in most people mm -hmm. so what's the sort of key ingredients of a healthy microbiome which has been quite elusive um so we you know we've got a list of good and bad microbes that's getting bigger and bigger that we find if you get that ratio right that's that's right. that's associated with all these good health come health outcomes and associated with these um healthy foods as well so it's the link between the foods the microbes and the, and the health outcomes right 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 but you need these big data sets you know, like we did in genetics before you really start to get uh, the clues out that you know if you're dealing with just hundreds of people it's just we have too much variation to be able to deal with it so. right and and those big data sets you know introduces this idea of of citizen science and you know i want to get to personalized nutrition but i don't think we can really talk about that until we kind of uh discuss the uh, you know the impact and the potential impact of of what this whole emerging world of citizen science is and the the kind of advent of these technologies by dint of zoe and you know other you know other kind of uh, things that are out there that are allowing you to run you know incredible uh incredibly detailed experiments at a massive scale unprecedented in the history of science because um you know will and i were, were chatting the other day and he was telling me like listen in testing or in science historically you can have a small population of peop people that you kind of control and you can get very detailed information out of them or you have population studies that are very general and basic because you lack that level of detail and control and now because of these technology platforms and you know in particular what zoe is doing you can get both you can get the best of both right which opens up a whole new world of you know kind of data analytics and the power of uh, of the results that you're seeing to you know create predictive outcomes and and again like diagnostic tools yeah no i think it's it, it's a real game changer in science because you know, in a very short period of time, we've built up the largest microbiome database in the world. We're now uh, doing, G, you know, microbiome sequencing on two and a half thousand people a week and doubling that very soon. Because, in a way, people are paying for those tests themselves and they're all signing consent forms to say they agree to share that data mm -hmm. for science so that, you know, it's not just lost as it would be in any normal medical clinic or uh, private facility or whatever. So it's all going back into a large database that we, you know, we've published, I think Zoe's published like 40 papers now uh, on this kind of data. So it is a whole new phase, I think, of science. So rather than waiting five years to get a NIH grant or, um, it's so slow you can do this in real time mm -hmm. and get these results back and i think my eyes were open to this um you know we'd, we'd started zoe but then a, the pandemic hit and um 2020 and obviously everything all our clinical studies stopped on the twins and so while cycling home from in london i had the idea of uh asking uh, repurposing the the sort of zoe app which was based for nutrition to understand covid and get covid symptoms etc so it was a bit of a wild idea but the my colleagues george and jonathan loved it the whole company loved it and so in five days we built this app which um went live totally raw full of mm -hmm. bugs you know and thought it would flop but at least we'd done our bit and we had uh, a million people download it in 24 hours so wow one of the biggest sort of health how'd you manage things. that uh, social media mm. everyone shared it so this is a great idea it was the first day of the lockdown in the uk and uh, we launched it a, a week later in the us and within two weeks we had two million and then we eventually got up to four million people using this app uh, at a time when there was 
people wanted to unite to do something mm -hmm. and the government was useless um, you couldn't go and see your doctor you know you were told to stay at home um, you couldn't get tested so it, it it just struck a chord and we were told no one over, over 60 is going to use an app right that was the other thing to say well you know <laughs> technology is not for oldies you know it, they have to be, you've got to send them a web page or you yeah. know or a questionnaire prove that wrong you know we had people in their 90s doing this um and it it, it absolutely took off and so it became the number one tool in the UK for knowing out where outbreaks were happening and what was going on and we learned also what the new symptoms were which were not what we were told from the original Chinese uh, variant and so uh, just in, in real time we were seeing uh, as people reported on the app rather than old-fashioned science of questionnaires and you know waiting a year mm -hmm. to validate the paper and whatever in real time we, we got a system worked out with the team at Zoe so that we knew that um, loss of smell for example was being reported by you know a third of people who had you know had all these other symptoms of COVID or tested positive. So, right. So that's the origin of of how it was determined that loss of smell was a thing. Right. It came out of that originally. Clinicians noted it in in Italy. So they were saying, oh, "Isn't it strange? I've got you know um, ENT people were saying I think this seems something must be happening, but they couldn't tell. They couldn't do a proper study. So um, it was a combination of ha having that real data in uh, millions of people mm -hmm. and we presented it and you know suddenly WHO and all these other countries around the world um, changed their criteria it was, it was the UK was the slowest to change but interestingly because they they hadn't done the study themselves but um, that was that was a wake-up call about how fast this new way of doing science with new technology with apps citizen scientists working together could do so much and we did lots of other stuff um, that I'm really really proud of the, the team for doing as well as the other symptoms we found delirium in old people was a sign children got very different symptoms we we looked at the skin we we asked people to send pictures of their skin rashes with COVID mm -hmm. I think we got 30,000 pictures wow um, and formed an atlas that you know people could see around the world um, we um, there, was some, there was COVID tongues, so people were sticking their tongues out, taking pictures, you know. And suddenly, people felt engaged for the first time. They were doing something, and I think yeah. it, it was really important. We did a study that would have taken, you know, five million dollars and five years to do, where we we asked a million people to fill in a diet questionnaire. Um, in the U.S. and the U.K. and, and looked at their severity of COVID, they got. You know, a year later, mm. and with that data, we clearly showed that diet quality was one of the biggest factors in determining uh, how you were likely to die or to stay in hospital or have really serious COVID. So a link with the immune system and nutrition. So, and this is all done at the speed of light. We were writing papers right. in a few days. Yeah, um, shocking. I mean, how, so four million crazy. people. How many people are on the app now? Uh, we have about uh, there's still about three hundred thousand still logging uh -huh. uh, daily, and we've but we've it's so it's three years on now. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's obviously come down from the millions that were doing it, but we've repositioned it um, into a health study app. So we've we got consent to study more than just COVID. And we're now using it to do other lifestyle factors. So we realize its potential. And so um, we, uh, for example, have just finished a study on intermittent fasting. So mm -hmm. we've got 140,000 people to agree uh, to change their method of eating to eat in a, a time-restricted eating window of 10 hours. And we repurposed the app and, and gave them so they could fill this in and tell us how they were doing in terms of their mood, their sleep, their appetite, um, uh, their weight, and any other, any other factors we wanted to and uh, got this launched really fast. And amazingly, most people, and they could do the fasting whenever they wanted. So we were also looking 
it's a way of looking at not just does it work, but how practical is these, you know, because you have these tiny studies done on 10 people, mm -hmm. hand-picked volunteers yeah. from Stanford. I mean, what can you, you know, really uh, extrapolate not from that that's meaningful? Yeah. So it was really cool to see how many people managed to do it. And I think it was about 80% or something managed to do it for at least three weeks, at least, you know, five or six days a week of just eating in a 10-hour window. And, you know, we're still writing up the paper, so I can't give you all the, um, the details, but it was super encouraging because the people that did manage to do that 10 hours you know, reported all kinds of benefits on some of their GI health, you know, many of them mm -hmm. were less bloating, uh, mood improved, and interestingly, appetite didn't go up because mm. you know, we're all told, well, if you... And there were differences between men and women, differences in different ages, uh, but the fact we could do this massive study um, at very little cost uh, in, in such rapid time really means, for me, this it really is the future of how we can particularly do subjects that don't get the funding. You know, the, the sort of studies about who's going who's gonna to give you big money to do I don't know, meditation right. or uh, right. yoga or right, right, right. Um, five minutes exercise or um, going to bed earlier or, uh, you know, cutting back on alcohol or, you know, just seeing what are the practical cold showers, you know, who knows, you know, these things. Mm -hmm. You get... You know, the, you get the aficionados who tell you, yes, you know, the, the dedicated gurus say, if you do this, it always works. All anecdote. But what about the real, you know, the person on the street? How good, useful mm -hmm. is it for them? How easy is it to do? Fascinating the people, you know, because we were told, like, intermittent fasting works better if you... Um, you, you do your fasting later at, at night. So you don't eat after, right. say, 5 p.m., right, right? Right, right, Yeah, like that 10-hour window. When is that 10-hour window? And what are the age of these people? And what are the foods that they are eating when they break so, their fast? There's all kinds of variables. And then beyond that, there's adherence issues. And are these well, people even being honest you know, well, with what they're reporting? None of these things are useful if you can't right. adhere. It's like diets, right? Mm -hmm. Completely pointless if you can't stay on it long term. So finding out that, you know, only about a quarter of people... Uh, in the UK preferred to, to do their fasting late at night, i.e., you know, have an early meal mm -hmm. and then uh, most people, it was easier in their lifestyle to like delay or skip breakfast. And that's just really useful to know that saying, well, actually for most people, even if it's not quite as good biologically, they can keep, probably keep that going for years. Mm -hmm. So it's much better rather than this purist idea that this is the only thing right. that people should like do. Right, what's, like what's replicable and sustainable. Uh, yeah, and if you do that, then are you eating at, you're, you're probably eating dinner at six or seven as opposed to 10 at night and what's the implications of that. But the real power, it seems, comes in when you, when you layer on top of that all kinds of other uh, sort of biometrics from heart rate variability, the, the 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 glucose monitor that's showing how you're metabolizing you know your food um, resting heart rate you know metabolic rate all these things with these you know kind of devices now that all you know establish a matrix of variables that you can then compare and contrast to draw you know a more kind of uh, intelligent conclusion from just I feel better or I slept better but well actually if I look at this you were your deep sleep number increased or your REM went up or it went down. Yeah, I think it's the, the next like, phase. Right? That's the next yeah. phase, I think, is to, having shown this works at a, a sort of crude level, is to try and get people to input, you know, either automatically or semi-manually mm -hmm. some of these, these inputs and then uh, rework some of the, this data. And we want to also, with people doing the Zoe, the paid Zoe program, also start having some of these interventions as well. So that, you know, you know, every every wave of different week might do a different intervention. Mm -hmm. So we can actually see, well, can you personalize some of these lifestyle things well? Can you predict who's going to do better? Are you, is there a certain cold shower person? Is there a certain mm -hmm. early fasting person? Can you predict who they are as well? So I think the more you can combine these things together with these interventions as opposed to just observation, 
Mm -hmm. um, the more you can do it. And, and everything we've seen is people are super willing to take part. You know, even if they've been paying money, they, they, they like the idea of being in these large experiments as long as you give them, you feed back the data. So in the past, researchers like myself have been grabbing all the information you can and then five years later you get a little you know a note saying thank you we published it in nature you know you pray for God what it was right thanks for your help now it's very much you know you've done the study people want to know how they got on how they compared to other people and it's this is what we have to start to do much better than we've done in the past but I think it's I think it's really exciting. I wish we'd discovered this uh, 20 years ago. 